what's the purpose of today? So we really want to hear your perspectives. Um, and we've got a really great um, mixture of um, colleagues from different um, providers in health and social care. We want to explore what you think good workforce wellbeing look like, looks like, and really particularly from your perspective to hear a bit in your own experience about the things that have gone really well um, in this area and also the challenges that you face when trying to look after your own workforce. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a good discussion in breakout rooms and then come back to um, reflect on some key themes. So I'll hand over now to Emily, who will provide a bit of background and context to why we're doing this today. Great. Thank you, Natalie. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining. It's really great to see such a good turnout. Um, so first of all, we just wanted to spend sort of 10 minutes or so really setting the scene and, and giving a bit of background and, and context for why we're, we're sort of invited you here together to for this discussion today. Um, so the, the project that um, our group of clinical fellows have been working on is looking at um, the well-being of, of the workforce and thinking about what CQC's role might be in, in influencing um, improvement um, for the workforce. I think we can all recognise that uh, health and social care are currently going through a workforce crisis um, where we've got very high demand and we've got problems retaining staff um, and bringing new staff into roles as well to support the services. It's something that was picked up and, and talked about in CQC's state of care this year or sort of last year in September um, with headlines that will not be unfamiliar to you all. Um, so persistent under, understaffing, um, struggling to a, a attract staff and, and recognising that this is both in, in the social care sector and also in the healthcare sector and then the kind of knock on impact of that on on patient care on sort of the gridlock to the system and, and um, people being able to, to move through the system and and have the, the person centred um, safe and quality care that that we all aspire to deliver. Um, when we look at sort of why there is this workforce crisis I think that um, during COVID, there was very much a stronger awareness of the importance of the well-being of the workforce and that the workforce were going through and being exposed to very traumatic conditions um, and the recognition of the need actually to, to support the workforce to, to be well in order to be able to, to manage. Um, so um, I think there's been much more of a focus over the, the past few years sort of since COVID started about the importance of, of employers supporting their, their staff to be well um, and thinking about, you know, what, what do we mean by um, by healthy and well workforce? How can we support them to work well and to be well? And what is the employer's role in doing that? And there is more and more emerging evidence that is linking the state of the workforce to the ability to provide quality and, and safe care. So um, there's more evidence that's showing that staff who are not well um, are less likely to be able to provide safe and quality care. It happens the other way as well. So um, staff who are exposed to unsafe situations um, then develop moral injury and that can then lead them to being unwell as well. So it can end up being a bit of a vicious cycle. So as an organisation sort of thinking about transitioning into the new single assessment framework, this gives the organisation uh, um, the ability to, to think actually are there other areas that actually we need to be looking at when we're going into providers um, to assess whether that provider is able to provide quality and, and safe and, and quality care for patients. Um, as we were, so as a group of fellows, we came into the CQC um, last year and we were really, really pleased to see that under the domain caring and the new single assessment framework, um, there is now a quality statement that is about actually caring for workforce as well as caring for patients. Um, so the new single assessment framework, um, we've got the we statements and so under caring we've got this statement about workforce well-being and enablement um, the we statement being we care about and promote the well-being of our staff and we support and enable them to always deliver per person-centered care um, and this is this is really exciting because it means actually that if CQC is now looking at this then um, We've got the ability to go in and actually ask staff, you know, are they being supported? Are they being supported in, in a way to be able to actually look after their patients? Um, and we've done quite a lot of um, sort of 
work since we've come in thinking about the influence of CQC, how CQC can work to drive improvement. Um, thinking about the the eight levers of, of regulation and and opportunities to influence Im improvement. And this comes from a, a piece of King's F Fund and Manchester University um, in I think 2018. Um, so we've sort of looked at, right, we know that there's this opportunity um, because we've got this new quality statement in and the new way of inspecting um, for three clinicians having come out of the, the clinical environment for a year, having worked through COVID, it's a bit of a passion project for us. We feel very strongly that um, there is, is more that can be done to try and support the workforce to be well. Um, and so this provided a, a fantastic opportunity for us to work with CQC um, to, to really support them in, in trying to approach this, this new way of, of, um, of regulating, this, this new element of regulation and, and inspection. Um, so what we've been working on over the last few months um, as a team is trying to develop what good workforce wellbeing looks like and doing that through a series of engagement events. So um, we've done some focus groups with some frontline staff. Um, we've done focus groups with inspectors. We have been talking to other arms length bodies and organisations that are supporting the health and social care sector about work that they are doing relating to workforce wellbeing. Um, and today we're really excited to have you here as representatives of your organisations and providers um, to continue the conversation and to continue to develop our learning. And we're hoping that this is going to feed into development of policy um, that will underpin the new quality statement um, and inform the, the way that we will inspect um, to develop some resources internally that are really going to um, support our inspectors to, to try and, and do this well um, and so this includes um, some potential written guidance and we're also looking at options such as doing a podcast um, that we hope will be available externally as well sort of supporting conversations between inspectors and frontline staff um, and then sort of thinking again about those impact mechanisms how else can we influence improvement and get people talking about this so um, there's actually just bringing people together in the same room and sharing ideas. Um, we've got a survey out at the moment where we're also looking at case, st case studies of things that have worked well. And also, actually, we want to learn from things that haven't worked well as well. Um, so we're gathering a, a huge amount of learning um, and this will, will be fed back to the CQC um, over the next couple of months to really try and inform how they do things going forward. Um, so as Natalie said, we're really hoping that um, the, the meat of the session is going to be um, in, in breakout rooms, um, which will, will be facilitated um, for the next hour or so. Um, we're going to go through sort of, we're going to be taken through three different discussion points. Um, and so we've just got an overview of the discussion points up here, but your facilitator will talk you through them. So to begin with, we'll start on what does good workforce wellbeing look like? Um, and then also what indicates that an organisation or team is caring for its workforce. So that sort of individual perspective and then that organisational perspective. And think outside the box, you know, what might represent good work, good well-being for, for one person or one group of people might actually be perceived very differently in another group. So hoping for some really dynamic conversation there. Um, then we're going to move on to discussion two, which is going to be about how do you assess the workforce uh, well-being within your organisation? Thinking about that monitoring, responding um, and actually if you were going to be inspected, actually what do you feel you might be able to do to demonstrate to CQC the state of your workforce and what you're doing for your workforce? Um, and then discussion three is more about um, examples. So things that you may have seen or heard about that have worked well, things that might not have worked well, how um, what some of the barriers and challenges might be to doing or delivering initiatives that really support your workforce to be well. I'd really love to hear from from a few of the groups and kind of share some of their um, some of the things that they've talked about if that's that's OK with people. So um, I think it sounds like we started talking about what good workforce wellbeing looks like, and it sounds like um, that's kind of different for everybody, and it's especially different um, between different providers, even though there's certainly commonalities um, between them. 
Um, and I can see that um, one of the things that several of the groups talked about was having a breadth of resources and making sure that there were things available that suited different types of people and might be acceptable for um, different people. So um, I don't know, does anyone from group room two want to come in? It looks like you talked a bit about accessibility of resources and breadth of resources. Does anyone want to expand a bit on the chat you had around that and kind of also sort of peer-to-peer -peer approaches as well as, as top-down solutions? So, hello, I, I'm Hi. Nikki. I was facilitating the uh, group two who were brilliant, I have to say. So, we, yes, we were talking about having a number of resources of different types that staff could access um, because one type of resource will not fit all. Some people were talking about the differences of having meetings to come to or to have um, uh, phone calls or, or online resources, um, all sorts of different ways that people um, can access information. Uh, but the the issue that we also talked about, um, and my mind's gone black, is it blank? See, we're talking about support for people with menopause. Thank you. I could do with that. Um, so, so the other thing we were talking about was um, right. So, I think he said that you guys discussed about kind of power from peers approach and utilizing staff's kind of lived experience as well. Yeah, we loved that. Yeah, I think I had that reflected in a few groups sort of thinking about how um, different, um, how people might want to access support differently. A lot of people I heard talking about um, mental health first aiders or um, having a, a defined person responsible for well-being so that some people knew that somebody in the organisation was, was kind of championing that. Um, I don't know if someone from group one wants to come in. I know you talked a bit about um, feedback and kind of getting some, um, some feedback from individuals, but also um, did, was it your group that talked a bit about getting feedback from other um, family members as well? Uh, apologies, Victoria. My, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, good. It was going a bit quiet just then. Um, so I was the facilitator for um, Group 1. Um, I mean, predominantly, the, the main the main theme has definitely been access. And by access, I mean it was how you engage staff um, when it is so busy and uh, pressurised right now, and um, how you can have a lot of facilities available and ready for um, the staff and work workforce, but it's more about how you can actually promote accessibility and allow them to actually do that. Um, we had some interesting conversations also about um, how the how the workforce um, is individual and therefore you do need to look at things from an individualized perspective. Um, and because of that, um, it's not a one size fits all um, solution. And that the biggest challenge I think with workforce wellbeing is that um, everybody's different. So an individualized approach is always was seen by the group to be uh, one of the, the key um, take home messages. Great, thank you, John. Um, and I can see that group three talked a little bit about kind of virtual engagement and face to face engagement, which I guess is um, really key after the last couple of years. I don't know if anybody from group three wanted to kind of touch on on that and some of the challenges um, that there might be in the kind of face to face versus virtual support. Hi, it's Sarah Kaya here. So I was the facilitator for that group. Although if anyone in the group wants to pitch in, then please do. Yeah, and when we we spoke about how um, at least having a kind of a hybrid approach, if if it was something that was just done kind of virtually or using kind of ele uh, you know electronic um, awareness campaigns, for example, they weren't quite so successful as if there was also some face to face work um, uh, done as well. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I think. Um, there was some some discussion around obviously you know coming out of the pandemic and such you know things had to be you know more um socially distanced etc but um that that kind of face-to-face -face work is really effective here great thank you Claire. um yeah absolutely and i and i think it sounds like there's some some kind of really um lots of crossover about accessibility and how different workspaces can make sure that staff have, have what they need um and i guess sort of i i overheard quite a few discussions from different groups about how 
um, they might how they might be able to demonstrate to um, the CPC how a workplace might be able to demonstrate how a how a organisation is meeting their needs. And there was sort of chat amongst the bigger organisations about things like staff surveys. Um, I don't know if the mate, somebody from the main room wanted to come in on that. I know that I overheard you guys having a bit of a discussion about um, sort of getting feedback and um, how you can, can get sort of things that are measurable for CQC to think about. Oh, yeah, I think when you said we one earlier, you might have been referring to us as well, because uh, one of the ideas you referred to earlier came up on a meeting, so I'll try and cover that as well. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we spoke a lot about kind of different sizes of providers, like you alluded to, and obviously there being workforce data within the NHS that's maybe not available in smaller providers. There was a little bit of conversation about um, how smaller providers may be able to demonstrate that thing and kind of being a bit creative in terms of the way they might gather feedback and be able to measure that. And I think there were some suggestions from, um, from people about that and that that didn't have to be really difficult or hard to implement. It just um, kind of demonstrated that people were asking staff what they needed and what they wanted and they were meeting their needs and that kind of individual um, aspect of wellbeing that was discussed by one of the other the rooms as well and kind of normalizing that as part of the day and there was the suggestion that you alluded to earlier about are there any organizations that have asked the friends and family of staff about their well-being because maybe they'd be the people that would be best place to comment on that uh, and I certainly haven't heard of anything like that um but yeah I think it was an interesting um question we ask people to be creative so yeah I think that was an interesting um point that was raised in the room. yeah definitely I've not um I've not heard about that as an idea before it sounds really interesting actually and I guess the people that the workforce live with know them best don't they so maybe that's an interesting angle to, to have a look at how about um, someone from group seven I don't think we've heard from you yet what was the headlines from from your group if there's somebody who wants to feed back to us from your group Hello, I was facilitating that group. I think people feeling listened to and closing the loop between being listened to at all levels and then not just being listened to, but being acted upon. So we looked at issues around compassionate leadership. Whose job is it? Where does it come from? How how is it embedded within an organisation? And also we were looking at things like roles of well-being champions and these compassionate leaders. Who's supporting them? What infrastructure is in place? Are we careful that we're supporting people who are also doing extra supporting as well as their workload? So it's quite an interesting conversation there about how, how are things embedded within the infrastructure of an organisation? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, something that's come out from several groups is that kind of how how do you how do you ensure that that kind of compassionate leadership feeds down to the workforce on the ground but also how does it feed up the other way and how do we ensure that the sort of senior leaders are listening to the workforce on the ground and that that's a safe space for for discussion let me get move back to sort of a couple of the groups we haven't heard for, from yet and see if they've got anything else to add i think that um one of the things that was brought up at the beginning of the session today was some of the kind of external challenges and the challenges that affect um, the ability for the workforce to um, to stay well, that are perhaps outside of the organisation's control. Um, and it sounds like that's something that that might have been touched on by some of the other groups. Um, I know that room four, you talked about the challenge of lack of staff. Did you want to expand on that at all? Um, yes, I'm very happy to come in. I facilitated group four. Um, yes, uh, we had a really useful and interesting discussion about, um, you know, some of the, the challenges that can impact around workforce well-being and certainly uh, lack of staff was was definitely mentioned, particularly uh, in the social care sector where, you know, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, pressures around kind of recruitment. But I think um, there was also the discussion that, you know, even in NHS trusts, um, there was a discussion, yes, there is that issue around lack of staff, but it's, I suppose, uh, there was that discussion about what 
um, you know, it's looking at the staff complement they have already within their organisation and how they can best use those resources and ensure that, that those staff feel valued and that, that they're an asset and that their well-being is looked after. Um, um, and also there is the, you know, there was the challenges, you know, because of the lack of staff, um, you know, do people have the time and energy and resources to dedicate to the, the well-being of their, because there's that work to be done that still doesn't go away. Um, and it's looking at, you know, kind of how, to um address that and 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 it's 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 a really complicated and balanced to to ensure but i think it, um although there was that awareness of the, the the issues and challenges i think um you know there was a lot of good initiatives as well discussed within within our group about uh, various well-being uh, workforce initiatives that really is about sort of trying to have that impact and trying to be proactive about it um and and particularly as a result of the pandemic um you know there's that real uh, push for working in this area uh, some some organizations the larger ones have put um extra resources in because of that recognition but other other organizations who are small have had to be more creative and sometimes just kind of senior leaders and having that recognition of you know or acknowledgement of you know like maybe having a lunch with a leader or a recognition of you know like their uh, the, a suggestion that they've made has been put forward. I think it's like little things sort of can make a difference too. So that's just some a few suggestions coming forward from Group Four. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. That's really interesting. I think um, certainly a lot of the groups have reflected the importance of the workforce feeling valued and having a space to have a discussion with senior leaders. So I, I like the idea of lunch with a leader. Um, and you know, I think that. That what's been really interesting from the discussions that we've had today is that we've managed to pull some kind of um, positive things from the negative. So although groups have sort of talked about the lack of staff shortages, I can see that in the feedback, a lot of groups have also talked about the value of exit interviews and how you can use that information to try and understand um, where you might be able to target well-being interventions in the future. So um, I think you know, we're running out of time, but thank you so much to everybody for um, for your discussion today and for all of your, your feedback. If there's anything we haven't mentioned or you think of, please feel free to put stuff in the chat and we will we will make sure we pick that up. But we will we will go through all the discussions and try and pick out some themes and try and understand kind of where the similarities are. But it certainly seems like um, we've got loads of great opinions on, on what good workforce well-being looks like we've definitely started to think about, you know, how we might be able to measure that um, or what the sort of important um, key points are really. Um.